Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we will explore the forgotten past of Forlorn, to understand how these wild and empty lands became a graveyard of ruins and home to globinoid beasts. Are you ready? Then approach the sacred groove, where the druid circle will share with us their wisdom and their knowledge. To now forgotten and abandoned, the lands of Forlorn have a rich history, and the druids who keep this knowledge alive are very careful to accurate report details of their past. The proud druids recall their ancient traditions and culture, and still use the Forfarian calendar to record their historical dates. With respect to their traditions, we will present the dates quoted here, with both records in the Fofarian calendar and the Barovian calendar, which became the standard calendar used in other lands of the realms of the mist. In the very distant past, the lands of Forlorn were occupied by Highlanders, were organized into numerous patriarchal clans. Although they had tenuous political relations, they were limited to a shy trade, occasional marital unions, and disputes over land. The Fofarian calendar began in the year minus 1387 of the Barovian calendar, when Karl Fifa leader of the Fifa clan, declared himself king of the kingdom of Fifa. The lands of which Forlorn was part had been invaded by the Blas, a warrior tribe from the northwest. Karol Fifa, a charismatic leader, managed to convince each of the many clans of the region to unite in combat to repel this dangerous enemy. Carol led the warriors into battle, and in the great clash known as the Battle of the Aglity, or the Battle of the Red Hillside, Carol managed to defeat and kill the Blast Chief in a direct confrontation. Although victorious, many lives were lost in the clash, with the FIFA clan being one of the most harmed. Carol, however, convinced the other clan chiefs of the advantage of their alliance and, and cooperation, and the leaders unanimously chose the brave Karao to become their king, thus giving birth to the kingdom of Fifa. Although prospering for many centuries under the royal dynasty of Fifa, the kingdom would eventually fall over and be conquered by the neighborhood kingdom of Marian. For centuries, Fifa became a vassal province of this mighty kingdom, and the Marionite language and culture was imposed by the conquerors. In their language, the kingdom of Fifa became known as Forfa, and the old city of Bianan became Bianan. The Forfarians, however, still wanted their land to be free once more. And after years under the yoke of the Marionite tyrants, the Fofarians rebelled and gained their independence. In the year of minus 435 of the Barovian calendar, a great revolt expelled the Marionites and conquered Forfar independence. However, without consensus on the new leadership and with the old clans unwilling to relinquish their control, the old kingdom is split into several small baronets, avoiding an internal conflict over the kingdom throne. The barony of Forfa fell on the leadership of the Ablan clan, a family of great power and influence in the region, with Donan Ablanc, the first baron of Forfa. 
For many years, the governments and dominions over these lands in times of peace or conflict was never truly challenged. However, even the might clan Ablanc was destined to fall, and the seeds of its destructions began to germinate in the year 206 of the Barovian calendar, when a conflict broke between the barony of the Western Highlands and the Marsh of Guetia. Guetia was a small kingdom that was situated between the lands of the barony of the Western Highlands and in the kingdom of Merion. Their proximity to the ancient conquerors of the kingdom of Merion and their constant alliance with their old enemies made the other clans of the region to view the Goethes with suspicion. When a land conflict broke out, this animosity became an open conflict and war, and the barony of the Western Highlands sought the barony of Forfa as an ally. The call for support came at an inconvenient time, however, as the chief of the clan of Blanc was in the middle of preparations to celebrate his daughter, Flora Ablanc's marriage to Rivalin Aptosh. The couple was loved by the people, and the marriage was long awaited by the Forfarians. Thus, Baron Ablanc agreed to send troops to his ally, but only after the marriage was celebrated. The marriage was consumed and celebrated, but a shadow of war hung over the couple. Only after a few days of marriage, they were separated when rivaling Abtosh departed to lead the march of the soldiers to the war. During the confrontation, rivaling Abtosh proved his worth and heroism in leading the battle against the Goetirians. When he managed to defeat Earl Dundungan, ruler of the Marsh of the Goetir. At the death of their leader, the Goetir's troops disbanded and began to flee, but the Druids, supporting the barony of Forfa, conjured a terrible storm. Rivalin rashly ordered the Forfarian troops to pursue the fleeing enemy troops, but the storm turned out to be a double-edged blade and many of the allied troops were lost or killed by the force of the storm. Rivalin, who led the troops, was lost in the Turatian storm and did not return to camp, being presumed dead after a few days. The victors returned home, bringing a victory with a bitter taste, and Flora Ablanc refused to believe that her husband had perished. She fervently clung to the idea that he would one day return home. As rumors began to circulate among the people of Birnan that Rivalin had been seen wandering through the streets at night in torn and bloody robes and a maddened look, Flora saw her hopes renew and despite her family protest, began to wander around the village alleys at night looking for her husband. The Aplanks tried to dissuade Flora from her escapades, especially after discovering that Flora was pregnant and carrying a son of Rivalin. Flora, however, was driven mad by the pain and hope of seeing her husband again, and escaped her confinement until one night she finally found Rivalin. Rivalin had returned as an undead creature, a vampire. Wounded and forsaken on the muddy battlefield, without a funeral or caretaker of his soul, Rivalin had risen from the death to drink the blood of the living. Flora realized with horror what her husband had become, but her horror was overcome by her mad love for him. She met every night with her lover, who fed on the blood of his pregnant wife. Rivalin's hunger was not easily satisfied by the little blood that he'd taken from Flora, and soon other victims began to appear in the city with their bodies drained of blood. Enraged 
the villagers organized a group of hunters to find Rivalin, who was hidden in a grove near Birnan. Flora, in despair, asked her father to intercede in favor of her lover, but the Baron of Forfa, discovering his daughter madness and sin, refused to help. Rivalin was found in his daytime sleep and destroyed and the hunters returned in a few days with the beheaded body of the vampire. Flora, maddened with grief, threw herself on the remains in mourning and veneration, and the villagers began to wonder if she had not been totally corrupted by evil, carrying a child contaminated with vampiric blood. Baron Forfa interceded on behalf of his daughter, driving the population away and defending the life of the unborn child and heir. In 207 of the Barovian calendar, the child was finally born and was called Tristan. The people of Forfa decided it was finally time for Flora to pay for her sins. An angry mob stormed the hall of the Ablanks, but Flora fled with her child and ran through the woods to a sacred grove where she found Ruo, a druid. In desperation, Flora handed her son to Ruo, begging her to protect her child. When the enraged mob finally found Flora, she was accused of being a witch and lynched by the population. Legend tells that Flora Sensing the vile fate that awaited her, cast a severe curse upon the people of Forfa, and was finally hanged from an ancient oak tree. Upon the druid promise that she will deal with the child, the mob's fury was finally appeased, and they returned to their homes. Flora curses the curious to come true, but in 222 of the Barovian calendar, the body of the druid Ruos was found torn at the feet of the old oak tree where Flora had been hanged. Many believed that the ghost of Flora had returned to avenge her death, and the druids themselves left the sacred grove, claiming that a sinister presence now resided there. With the departure of the druids, the evil that inhabited this place only grew, and Humo says that the woods became the abode of ghosts and abnormally large wolves. In the year 231 of the Barovian calendar, a great fire burned the sacred grove for many hours. By the time the flames finally subsided, all the trees were now ashes except for the old oak where Flora was hanged, which remained untouched. After the fire, the wolves that inhabited Forfa became aggressive and bold and openly attacked cattle and people when they crossed their path. Hunting groups were mounted to deal with these beasts, but their numbers did not seem to diminish, and many claimed that even the dead wolves rose as undead to continue their endless hunt. In the year 250, the constant lupine attacks were inexplicably reduced. In the same year, however, Baron Keegan Ablanc and Baroness Eileen Ablanc, parents of Flora, died of unexplained causes just a few days apart. In the absence of an obvious illness or cause of death, rumors again suggested that the curse and revenge of the ghost of Flora had returned. With no heirs of the clan at Blanc, the government of the barony of Forfa passed to the clan Apfito, which assumed the rule with the promise to make efforts to rid Forfa of the influence of evil. However, the Apblancs had not yet been eliminated from history. 
in the year 422 of the Barovian calendar, a distant cousin of the Ablunks arrived from the barony of the Western Highlands to claim the heritage and lands of the Ablunk family. The charismatic young minstrel, whose history records only as Lord Ablunk, decided to settle near the town of Birna. The eccentric and charismatic minstrel was very rich and refused to leave the place where he planned to build his home, next to the old oak where Flora were hanged. Using his vast resources, he began the construction of a fortified tower and ordered his worker to clear the area of all vegetation except the old oak. The construction was marked by strange accidents, but was finally completed, and Lord Ablanc began to receive visitors in his tower. The charismatic young minstrel, who never left his lands and retired to his chambers during all the night period, caught the attention of many ladies of the Fofarian society, but eventually fell in love with Isolt Apvei, a beautiful young woman devoted to the fate of the ancient, whom he married in the year 426 of the Barovian Canada. From the union of this marriage were born three children, and also the conflicts between the couple, since Lord Ablanc refused to see their children educated in the fate of their mother. Tragedy struck the clan Ablanc when in the year 439 of the Barovian calendar, the couple's youngest son, Gideon Ablanc, with just 12 years old, was tragically devoured by a pack of wolves. In the year 446 of the Barovian calendar, his eldest son, Mohot Ablanc, was murdered inside the tower by an assassin with unknown purpose. In the year 451, the couple's only doctor, Bregan Ablanc, disappeared under mysterious circumstances. After so many tragedies, Lady Isolt Apvey committed suicide by launching herself from the tower in the year 452. In the ensuing years, Lord Ablanc continued to live alone in his tower, abandoned by servants who believed the place was cursed and haunted. After the year 463 of the Barovian calendar, Lord Ablanc himself was no longer seen, and many speculated that he had committed suicide or abandoned his tower. The tower remained in a total state of neglect until in the year 519 of the Barovian calendar, a new Ablanc appeared in the region, taking possession of the abandoned tower. Mark Ablanc declared himself the great grandson of Lord Ablanc, claiming that his grandmother was Bregain Ablanc, the doctor who had disappeared from the tower in the year 451. After some reluctance of the authorities, and given the great similarity of the man to his ancestors, Mark was recognized as the legitimate heir to the lands of the Ablanc. Mark quickly began an ambitious project to expand the tower and build a large wall around it, as well as a new deforestation of the surroundings. Owner of great riches, he began to hire a large number of mercenaries to act on his behalf. The clan Napfito ordered Mark Ablanc to seize the fortifications of his tower and even sent soldiers to prevent the construction, but they were massacred, starting a civil war. The clan Apfito, however, also had to deal with a growing number of monstrosities and aberrations that now seemed to infest Forlorn, 
as if the lands themselves were being corrupted by evil. Despite the conflicts, Marca Blanc completed his construction in the year 522, and the Tower of the Ablancs was now renamed the Castle Ablanc. Marc Ablanc increased his forces and soldiers until, in the year 533 of the Barovian calendar, he openly challenged the clan Abfito for the title of Baron of Forfa, and the conflict intensified to an open and bloody war. In the year 543, one of the bloodiest episodes in fallen history occurred when the Abfito Hall was surrounded and captured by Mark Ablanc forces. At that night, he sealed the doors of the hall and tossed it on fire, killing 23 members of the clan Abfito, including children and women. In the year 546, the people of Bienan signed their surrender to Lord Mark Aplanc, recognizing him as the Baron of Forfa. However, Mark Aplanc continued his bloody hunt for the survivors of the clan Abfito, which only ended 547 of the Barovian calendar, when he captured and ordered the torture and execution of the last member of the clan Abfito the paladin Andrew Abfito. This tragic event marks the end of the civil war, but also the passage of the barony of Forfa to the lands of the mists, in what became known as the Day of War. The lands of the barony of Forfa suffered tremors as the earth shook and it was shrouded by the mists. Many landslides occurred, giving rise to a great lake known as the Lake of the Red Tears at the foot of Castle Ablanc. But the most tragic effect of this passage through the mists was the horrendous transformation of almost all of the inhabitants of Forfa into hideous, beastly looking humanoid creatures called goblins. Only a small portion of the population remained immune to such effects, and the druids believed that only those with head hair, who still had in their blood the fairy heritage of the good people, escaped unharmed. The lands of the barony of Forfa were now isolated in the mists, with only the northwest border connecting to the neighborhood kingdom of Barovia. Some of the survivors of the Day of War migrated to Barovia, seeking refuge from the horrors of these lands. But some brave druids and natives still remained to fight the dark forces. It was the Barovians, after exploring this abandoned kingdom, full of wild beasts, who named these lands Forlorn, a desolate and hopeless land. There is no news of Marc Blanc and his empty conquest, and the old castle of Blanc, now abandoned, was renamed by the Barovian explorers as Castle Tristenoira. The druids, however, believe that it is from this castle that lies the center of evil and corruption of Forlorn. As the ghost of Castle Tristenoira, who they call in their tongues Solida, corrupts the land. The grotesque and dangerous creatures, known as goblins, now infest this domain, as well as the huge wolves that accompany them, and continue a major campaign of deforestation. The druid circles now fight the goblins for the preservation of these lands, and they believe these creatures are in service of a dark lord who inhabits Castle Tristenoira. In the year 735 of the Barovian calendar, a powerful group of adventurers 
came to Forlorn from Gungarak and attempted to infiltrate Castle Tristenoira, but were destroyed by the forces that inhabited. Only two adventurers survived that terrible night at the castle and escaped from there, taking with them a ravaged woman that they have rescued from the castle dungeons. Recently, in the year 750, the druids themselves, under Shulag's leadership, attempted to attack Castle Tristenoria, but failed miserably in their attempt. In these lands, ravaged by conflict and atrocities, the soil itself seemed to have bathed in blood of countless victims of its terrible past. However, even the druidic knowledge have its limits, and we will have to explore these mysterious lands by ourselves if we are to discover more about the secrets and mysteries of this desolate domain. Do you still intend to follow me on this dangerous journey? So subscribe to this channel and enable the notifications and join me on this expedition as we explore the darkest corners of its woods and mountains and unlock the secrets that are guarded by these abandoned ruins.